Hello everyone, my name is Mustafa Hajij. I'm an assistant professor at Santa Clara University. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about topological deep learning. This is joint work with Kyle Stephen. So I will start motivating this work by talking about supervised machine learning problems in the statistical setting. In a statistical setting, you are usually given a data set S that consists of pairs XI and YI. And this data set is usually sampled from an unknown probability, uh, joint probability distribution PXY. And the problem is after giving this, this data set uh, S um, is to, to, uh, to find the function F from the set X to the set Y such that uh, F predicts the correct label Y uh, for a new point uh, XY sampled from uh, the same probability distribution P. For the purpose of this talk, we will only consider classification supervised machine learning problems. And in this case, usually the set Y is a finite set. So, and each YI uh, corresponds to a label associated with the point XI. So a, a, an example that you usually consider is the MNIST data set. So here each XI corresponds to an image of a digit. And each yi corresponds to the label of that uh, of that image. So in the in this case, um, uh, so for instance, the data set uh, the MNIST data set consists of the of the following pairs. Each xi is a uh, an eight by eight uh, image uh, that represents uh, one single digit, and each label is one hot encoder. It has uh, zero everywhere and one uh, where. Uh, that corresponds to the, the label. So here you have six, and here it's, it is in the sixth position. And so we are seeking, in this case, a function from R64, so eight by eight, 64, uh, to R10. Uh, 10 here is the number of labels. Um, so we are seeking a function that basically after training, uh, after seeing this data set, uh, can predict uh, the correct, uh, what's the correct label on a, a given new image is sampled from the probability distribution that gives us this uh, this MNIST data set. The way we usually find f is by, by defining some sort of cost function, c, that penalizes the deviation of the predicted labels f x of i uh, from the true label uh, y of i. So let's try to find a picture of what we are trying to do in a supervised machine learning problem. So I'm going to represent my space x by this manifold here, represented by the torus. And um, I'm going to represent the sample points that I sampled using my probability distribution P uh, by those points indicated with the star points and with the circle points. And so you can visualize what we are trying to do is we're trying to find a mapping from this manifold to maybe a simpler manifold that basically separates those points uh, that are uh, the star points uh, uh, to one part of the manifold and the um, uh, circle points to another part. So this picture motivates us to think about the input space and the output space as topological spaces. And we are acting on those topological spaces by a continuous function that deform the input space to the output space. So today I'm going to introduce to you topological deep learning. So topological deep learning is a formalism that is aimed at two goals. So the first goal is to introduce topological language to deep learning for the purpose of utilizing the minimal mathematical structure uh, to formalize problems that arise usually in a generic deep learning problem. And the, the second goal uh, is to augment, enhance, and create um, deep learning models uh, utilizing uh, tools that are available in topology. So of course, this is very broad, and I'm not going to cover everything about topological deep learning today. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, things that are only maybe concerned with the first, um, with, uh, with the first uh, goal here. So I'm going to talk about classification problems um, from topological settings. So I'm going to define the, the classification problem using just topological tools. And um, in using this topological framework, I'm going to then show you uh, when the classification problem is possible, when it is not possible. Um, then I'm going to show you the usefulness of uh, putting things in this topological perspective. Um, so I'm going to show you how 
very easily we can improve things that are not ready uh, that are not readily available using maybe statistical uh, tools so before we move further in our discussion let's define neural networks precisely so a network is a function from rdn to rd out that consists of a composition of other simpler functions called layer functions so each layer function usually consists of uh, a affine part, so you have a matrix W and you have a vector B, uh, so that's the affine part, and also you have a nonlinear function, sigma, and this uh, nonlinear function is applied coordinate wise, so this affine function takes a vector and uh, spits out another vector, so you apply this nonlinear function coordinate wise to the output vector from the affine function. Um, um, so um, it, that's, that's usually the, the layer function. So for the purpose of this talk, we will only consider a very simple nonlinear function called the ReLU um, nonlinear function. And ReLU of x is simply just max x uh, and 0. So just um, if the number is negative, then it just um, uh, returns 0. If the number is positive, it returns that number, basically. Um, sometimes those linear functions are also called activation functions. So let's say that we have a classifier given in the form of a neural network. And we like to make a hypothesis on how this neural network acts as a classifier on uh, the topological input space and deform it into the final space. So this is the image that we made earlier, um, a, a picture image um, on how a classifier might uh, uh, deform the input space into, into the, the final space. So remember that a neural network is a composition of continuous functions. So the hypothesis that we like to make and uh, uh, prove throughout this, this talk is that the neural network really acts on the input space by maybe massaging the manifold by uh, those continuous functions and, uh, and at every step uh, try maybe to, uh, to de deform the, uh, uh, the parts that are uh, labeled by the star and the parts that are labeled by uh, the, the circles and try to separate them uh, by acting on the, uh, this manifold by those continuous operations. And hopefully in the final stage, it will arrive at, at this final shape where uh, these two labels are separated uh, in the final manifold. So now we're going to make the first experiment towards testing this hypothesis. So let's say that we train a neural network on the MNIST dataset. And after training, let's say that we look at the image of the MNIST dataset under this neural network and um, uh, we observe the final layer. So um, this picture here represents a, a projection for the uh, final image of the MNIST dataset under a trained neural network. So you observe here that we have definite uh, clusters. So you see a cluster for the seven and a cluster for uh, the four and a cluster for uh, the twos and so on. And uh, so you see there are a clear separation between uh, uh, various uh, labeled parts of, of, of my data. And the question that we like to ask uh, is how this happened. So we had the original data uh, had some, some shape in, the, in, its, in its original embedding and the um, neural network acted on it and it deformed the original space into this final space. So we'd like to understand how this happens and why this happens from topological perspective. So let's start introducing the supervised machine learning problem from a topological point of view. So first, some notation. So I'm going to denote a manifold M of dimension N by M superscript N. And um, I'm going to denote by D to a disjunction of manifolds uh, with various dimensions. So the D here is a disjunction of M1, I1, M2, I2, and so on, MK, IK. And... Um, I'm going to define the term topological data to be a continuous function from uh, this set D to some ambient space E here, uh, e, where E is usually some Euclidean space. So I'm going to call the pair DH by topological data, and E here would be called the ambient space. So this setting here clearly corresponds to the statistical setting. So if you take E here would be um, the... Uh, uh, ambient space of the prob of 
the probability distribution that we introduced earlier and uh, 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 that we sampled the data from. And the support of, uh, of this probability distribution uh, is the image of, uh, of this function here, h. So since we are going to talk about classification problems in this topological setting, then we also need to talk about labeling in this setting as well. So um, I'm going to let a D and H be a topological data, just as before. And I'm going to define, given um, D and H a topological data, a labeling is just a finite set of subsets that are mutually disjoint and closed uh, from H of D. Um, so I'm going to refer to D, uh, the triplet D, H, and G by topological label data. So note that the existence of the labeling is equivalent to finding a function um, from a, the union of these sets to um, a discrete sets that consist maybe of the indices from one to d, and uh, you have um, so this this function basically determines this this partition for the union of all those sets. So uh, I will use uh, either one of these definitions definitions in the in the next slides. So now that we have the definition for topologically labeled data, we can start defining the topological classifier and start defining the, the topological classification problem. Um, so um, um, let dhg be topologically labeled data. This is just as before. So you have a function from your uh, original manifold or maybe this union of, of manifolds to the ambient space R of n. And, um, G here is a function uh, uh, from DFL, which is just just an union of the of the various labels. Uh, so this is just equivalent to what we had before. This is this this represents disjoint union of of mutually closed, uh, um, mutually disjoint and closed sets uh, inside uh, uh, D, and uh, a topological classifier is just a function from. Um, the ambient space of my data uh, to uh, some other space, R of K. So note that this definition is consistent with what classifier is in a statistical sense. And we say that, so a, this is just, just, just a continuous function, so we did not do anything here. So we need to, to, to define what this, uh, what this classifier really successfully does uh, 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 something as far as machine learning is concerned. So we say that F separates and uh, topologically labeled data, if we can find D disjoint embedding K dimensional desk. So this is K here is dimension of, of this, this ambient space, um, such that the image of, of, the, uh, of each labeled uh, uh, subset of DL is contained in that desk. So note that here, um, D is the number of, of disjoint sets here. So this D is, how, is the number of sets that are determined by, by this function G. Um, so indeed, uh, so topologically labeled a, a, a uh, topological classifier or even a classifier in a machine learning setting try to separate your data. Um, so if you are given maybe the data that is given by um, these two uh, manifolds here, uh, they are obviously, they cannot be separated within this ambient space, within the original space. However, um, you can imagine that you can maybe map this to a higher dimensional space and, se and separate those this data by, by desk that contain each one of them, and those desks are mutually disjoint. So from this perspective, a topological classifier take the data from its original space and maybe massage the, the, the manifold um, via continuous map or maybe a sequence of continuous maps um, and, the, and, the, and separate those data. And the R condition for separation is finding uh, a mutually disjoint embedded desk inside the ambient space where the, the, this is the codomain of the function f. So the first question that we like to ask is that given a topologically labeled data, can we always find a continuous function that separates this data? Um, so in order to, um, uh, to show anything about this, we're gonna recall some classical facts from topology. So we're gonna first recall the Eurasian lemma. So Eurasian lemma states that if you are given a two disjoint closed subset of a normal topological space X, then we can always find a continuous function F from X 
to zero one that sends the set A to zero and sends the set B to one. So just given this, um, this little fact, uh, we can um, show um, uh, that uh, uh, topologically labeled data are separable by by continuous functions. So um, uh, so let's state the theorem. If we are given a topologically labeled data, so this is as usual, you are given a function h from a, a disjoint union of manifolds D um, to some ambient space uh, Rdn, and uh, here I'm assuming my data is labeled by two labels. Um, and we're gonna we can we can extend this to n labels. Um, and uh, for the clarity of uh, of presentation, I'm just gonna state the result for two labels. Then we can always find a topological classifier that separates this data. And the proof is, is really easy. So uh, by definition, this uh, labeling function induces two closed and disjoint sets. So D1 and D2, these are just the inverse images of, of, of these uh, 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 singletons here. And by recent lemma, there exists a function uh, from D to 0, 1 that sends the first set to 0 and the second set to one, and uh, uh, since D is closed, being compact set of R, uh, compact set set of R D N, um, then by uh, also Euler's lemma, basically we can find a uh, continuous function uh, uh, from R D N. We can extend this, this continuous function to the entire space, um, and uh, uh, so I'm going to denote this function by f, and this f in particular. Uh, uh, coincide with the function f star on the set D. So in particular, uh, this function sends uh, D1 to 0 and D2 to 1. And so and hence, this function uh, uh, separates the data. And it's not difficult to extend this to find a function um, so um, from R D N to R K for, for any K. So the separability uh, on, uh, on R um, actually uh, guarantees the separability for any uh, uh, dimension k. Um, and you can also extend this if you have n labels. And this is again a, um, an extension of the of Euroson lemma on n labels. So um, we have this le uh, lemma here, which, which can be proven by applying uh, Euroson lemma uh, multiple times, basically. So if you are given uh, multiple closed and mutually disjoint sets, so n, n one of these, then there exists a continuous function uh, f from x to r that maps uh, each set ai to i for i equals to 0 to n. So far, we have studied the separability question in the context of continuous functions. So now we like to, to ask the same question in the context of neural network. So I'm going to let dhg be topologically labeled data, just as before. So I have a function h that map my distribution union of manifolds to the ambient space Rdn. And I have a, a label function g. And we like to ask this question, can we always find a neural network defined on Rdn, the ambient space of my data, that separates the data dhg? Uh, so we start by framing the softmax classification neural network using topological terminology. So let me introduce what uh, softmax classification neural ne networks are. So a, a softmax classification neural network is not very different from a ReLU neural network, except that it has a special function at the end called a softmax, softmax activation function. And a softmax activation function is, I'm going to give you the, the the exact definition in a little bit. Uh, it has a codomain, uh, the n, sim uh, n simplex. So um, I'm going to denote the n simplex as usual by delta n. It has n plus one vertices, uh, just the the, um, uh, the standard uh, uh, n simplex, the, the the convex hole obtained by uh, by those vertices. And the softmax function on n vertices is a function from R n to the interior of the n minus one simplex, and it's given by composition of two simple functions. The first one is the exponential function. So you apply, given a vector uh, on, on n coordinates, uh, you apply the exponential function coordinate wise on, on these coordinates. And the second one you uh, a normal, is a normalization function that takes a vector and then takes the summation of all those coordinates and then you divide by the summation. Um, so a network net is called a softmax classification neural network with n labels. If the finite layers 
if the final layer of that network is a softmax function. So um, n here will be always the number of labels in the classification problem, and each vertex vi corresponds precisely to one label li plus one uh, uh, in the um, in the label set that we introduced earlier. So this is just for the correspondence between the notations that we had uh, earlier. So if you are given a data set that looks like this, um, it would uh, say this, this is an annulus with maybe three labels, then what the neural network is trying to do, if, if you restrict its code domain to the simplex or with three vertices, and it's map, trying to map this region over here to this one, and this uh, uh, light blue region to this one, and this region here to this one. And so uh, it, as far as the cross entropy uh, loss function is concerned, um, the cross entropy uh, 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 penalizes the deviation of the mapping of those those points from uh, this vertex, and it uh, penalizes the deviation of map the map of all those points inside this region to to this vertex, and uh, similarly for for that vertex. So uh, topologically. Uh, some a this mapping here uh, happens through a sequence of continuous functions. Um, so uh, those sequence of continuous function must uh, uh, bend, uh, uh, quotient, and uh, uh, does all kind of topological operations. They allow topological oper uh, operations via those continuous maps uh, in order to achieve uh, this task. So which is continuously moving this space into uh, into this space here. So to gain more intuition on uh, the problem, let's consider an example. So here I'm considering the torus labeled by three labels. So I have a uh, green label and I have a yellow ye label. And to make this problem more interesting, I'm separating the yellow parts uh, by a uh, purple strip. So let's consider the action of a neural network on this data set and see how the new, this uh, uh, um, neural network uh, acts on this space and deform it into the final classification form. So the neural network that's uh, going to act on this space is going to be from R3 to R3. Uh, uh, so that's the this is the input and this is the output uh, for my domain and my codomain. And uh, if after classification, um, this neural network uh, uh, maps this space here to to this shape over here. And the question is, how did that happen exactly? So I'm gonna go over the details right now. So the neural network that I considered when I trained um, uh, uh, on this data set uh, consists of six uh, layer functions. So these layer functions uh, are given, uh, have this, this specific form. They are functions from R3 to R3 and they are, uh, 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 so each W here is just three by three matrix, and the the activation functions are just the ReLU functions. So they are max this number over here and zero. So um, let's see the uh, let's see the application of all those maps on the uh, act, uh, on the activations and see how how uh, the neural network deforms the space into the final space. So the first uh, the first function, the first nonlinear function, actually projects this space um, into this form here. So it gets rid of the hole in the torus. And the second one, um, uh, the nonlinear one, bends this space this way. So it starts to bend the, the, the place where there is a yellow part. And then the third part, for um, uh, which is the, uh, the, the linear part in F2, uh, w2 it bends the space here a little bit or shear it a little bit um, then the nonlinear part uh, takes this portion here the yellow portion and start bending it uh, so that it needs to cushion it later with this uh, uh, larger yellow part over here so and this is indeed uh, start to happen uh, in for inside the the third layer function so the uh, yellow parts are getting closer to each other over here and the, the manifold starts to take a 1D dimension. So as far as classification is concerned, um, you really don't need all those topological information. You don't need the hole here, you don't need the other hole. Uh, all those are redundant as far as the classification is concerned. So the neural network is deforming this space towards this goal, towards uh, making the points that are 
um, uh, yellow close to each other in, in one vertex and um, points that are green uh, close to each other in another vertex and so on. So let's observe this. So here, um, the nonlinear part actually uh, uh, started gluing the yellow parts together. So here you observe that uh, the yellow parts are extremely close to each other. They, uh, they are uh, almost they are very close to, be, to being identified. And the green part uh, uh, sep uh, got separated uh, here and the uh, uh, purple part got, got separated over there. So um, I'm not going to show you the rest of the function, um, uh, but it actually deforms it, the deformation from the, something like this to, to the final, sh final shape um, is not very difficult. So we also run an experiment on the same data set that illustrate an interesting behavior also about neural networks. So um, I'm considering the exact same data set that I had earlier and an almost exact same neural network. So I have uh, six layer functions, except F1 goes from R3 to R2, and F2 goes from R2 to R3. So if you observe here, the first projection actually is a bad projection as far as the classification is concerned. So the neural network cautions uh, part of the manifold upon itself. So it cautions the wrong portion on, on, on themselves. So the here part of, uh, of the green, it gets ma uh, get glued with parts of the yellow and get parts of the purple gets gets glued with map with part of the um, uh, yellow. So it's it's a total mess. Uh, so if, if a topologist was given this task, it would not do some a, a this choice uh, probably. It would make a choice like uh, like this one here. So the neural network is given the right um, uh, amount of space, uh, but yet nonetheless it it, it made the the wrong. Uh, uh, the wrong choice here. We're going to give some explanation at, at the end for why this behavior happens. Um, and uh, it is also shed some light on the interaction between neural networks and the underlying topological space. So let's uh, consider this a little bit more precisely. So a point X in my um, uh, topologically labeled data. Um, so if X is in the, in the domain of the neural network, and um, uh, then the image of this x uh, is going to be in the simplex d uh, uh, delta m minus one. Here I'm assuming that they have n labels. Then by definition, um, x is assigned the label li plus one if and only if the, the image of x belongs to the interior of the Voronoi uh, cell associated with that vertex i, okay? So uh, this is just, immediately by, by definition. So we immediately get the following uh, theorem. Let's just rephrase this in this uh, topological language. So if DHG is topologically labeled data, again with H, it maps D to um, uh, script D, um, oh, and which is contained in the ambient space RDN. And if DL is the labels, and uh, then the softmax classification neural network uh, separates the data if and only if the image of each labels, uh, each label inside uh, DL, uh, gets mapped in to the interior of the Voronoi cell cell associated with the vertex VI. So, this is just a restatement, a topological restatement of what's what's happening earlier. So this theorem here characterizes the separability of a topological data by a neural network, but it does not tell me exactly if a neural network is capable in the first place of. Uh, to separate a topologically labeled data. So we like that, of course, we like that something like this to always happen, just like in the case of uh, continuous functions. So the separability theorem and uh, another uh, uh, th fact uh, known in the literature of deep learning called universality of neural networks can actually be utilized towards this fact. So universality of neural networks essentially states that any continuous function can be effectively approximated by a neural network uh, uh, to an arbitrary precision. Uh, so uh, if we combine the separability theorem that we had earlier and with the universality uh, of neural networks, then we can always, given any uh, topologically labeled data, we can always effectively separate it by a neural network. If you are given a topologically labeled data, then you can always find a neural network that separates this topological labeled data. So I want to go the other way, way around here. And to show you that this interaction is non-trivial, 
Um, I'm go, so I'm going to state a, a theorem that seems obvious, but we think this theorem is generalizable to, to um, um, uh, for any neural network. Uh, we're going to talk about this a, a little bit at the end. Um, so let, I'm, I'm going to choose a neural network with a specific architecture. So I'm going to force the first function to go from n to k, where k is um, less a dimension less than n. And let uh, net1 be arbitrary. Okay, so uh, uh, I'll be only restricting the first function. Then what this theorem uh, is claiming, if there exists a topologically labeled data um, uh, with the appropriate dimensions, so the, the topologically labeled data has an ambient space, the input space, um, and that is not separable by, by this neural network that I started with. So you can always construct something, like the proof is really simple. You can pick a data set like this one, the same, um, um, uh, let's say the ambient speed is two here, I'm proving it for, for two. Then you can pick this data set uh, uh, like this one. And you can prove that any, uh, since you, uh, this thing here starts with, with a linear function, it has to be actually basically to map this to R1, since K, or to R0, since K is less than two in this case. And so it has to quotient the space um, into something that it's not going to be separable uh, as far as uh, classification, uh, as far as the separability that that we um, that, that we defined. So um, a, a neural network would not with this architecture would not be able to separate this data. So since we are considering this example, let's actually consider a neural network that separates this data. I think this example has some, some insight on how neural network operates, so I will go over the details of it. So consider, uh, this is my topologically labeled data, um, and I'm considering a neural network that consists of six layers. So I'm gonna show you the architecture for this neural network in detail. So the first um, layer that, that I chose goes from two to five. So we're gonna again talk about this at the end, why we chose five. And uh, uh, so th this, um, I'm projecting here for visualization purposes, um, the data set from R, uh, R5 to R3. Um, I'm using the, for the dimensionality reduction algorithm, I'm using isomap so that I preserve as much as possible of the local properties of my uh, original manifold in, in R5. So you see here in the projected uh, image, uh, the neural network starts to bend the space. And uh, um, it, this is actually what a topologist would do. Um, it, it would take this this uh, cylinder basically and try to bend this uh, towards uh, the goal of, of later identifying the the yellow parts together. So you see here in the case uh, uh, more clearly in the in the uh, next function. So this is the linear function uh, of F two. I'm, I'm taking that from uh, five to five again and uh, projecting using isomap. So you see here, it, it bends more towards uh, the this cylindrical shape. And uh, well, this all those dimensionality right now are not needed. So this is, again, the same observation that we had earlier. So the neural network cushions out all the space into one dimensional space. And now you're going to see that it's going to start to bend those yellow parts together. So this is, um, um, if you consider the next uh, nonlinearity here. So you see it start to bend the space now um, towards the goal of maybe cautioning those those yellow parts at the end. So you see here that it's it, uh, it's not visible here in the picture, but actually parts of those got, got cautioned out uh, here. And there's only one, this uh, not very well classified part portion and the neural network in the next one takes this portion here, this small, yellow portion and stretch it out all over this this part here and um, and uh, and then in the next one it just cautions cautions out all those parts and then the final softmax function uh, stretches all those parts here towards the middle and stretches all those parts here towards this 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 uh, yellow yellow region here so all those yellow regions inside and outside gets 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 mapped to here and the uh, purple strip gets mapped to over here So, so far we have given characterization for separability. So this is the mapping from here to the final space. And uh, what, we also, what we also like to do as well is we like to understand 
um, or characterize what the neural network is doing as far as a sequence of topological spaces. So, um, so we want to, to, to understand exactly or characterize um, uh, from topological perspective what the neural network is doing um, uh, uh, as, it's, as it's acting on the input space to define a topological space. So towards this goal, let net be a neural network that consists of L layers. And I'm going to define the i-th head of this net to be, I'm going to denote that by net superscript of i, to be the composition of the first i function. And if I'm given my data set to be x, then I'm going to define uh, x superscript of i uh, to be the image of the i-th head of, of, the, of the input topological space x. In the deep learning literature, um, those sets are called the activation of a neural network. So we'd like to understand the neural network net by understanding how the neural network acts on the input space X and how it deforms those sequences uh, uh, of, of topological spaces. So, so to achieve this goal, we're going to um, try to understand how each individual uh, uh, building block acts on, on those input spaces. So uh, these, uh, in my case, I'm going to consider ReLU activation functions. And then we're going to try to understand how the neural network acts as a whole, as a, as a, as a continuous function, uh, and how it's trying to accomplish the, the, the classification task. So let's consider the action of a ReLU activation function um, on a given set A in Rn. So if you are given a set A in Rn, then the ReLU activation function maps this set uh, in Rn to another uh, set. It's, uh, we get, we're calling the image, obviously, ReLU of A. Um, in, the, in one of those three following ways. So let's consider the figure here. Then I'll explain how uh, uh, it, it, the correspondence between the figure and what we have over here. So if we have, suppose that you have this data set here. That's, this is my A. Um, then, um, so this, my A here is in R2. So what the ReLU activation function is going to do here is going to leave all those points in the first quadrant um, uh, uh, without, without touching them. It's not, it's not going to move them. It's going to act on them by the identity, basically. However, the way it's going to act on this quadrant and this quadrant is going to, uh, to quotient those by mapping them, by mapping all the points uh, and projecting them on the, on the y-axis here and projecting them on the x-axis. And it's going to quotient all the portion for from uh, from the third quadrant. It's going to quotient all those points to 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 one point, which is the identity. So uh, as far as the definition is concerned, uh, this just makes everything positive. So take take all the points and you just make it you just uh, take uh, max that point uh, max that coordinates and zero. But as far as topology, if we think about this as a continuous function. This is a quotient map. It's quotienting all those space, all those parts to this portion, all those parts to this portion, and all those parts to this portion. So, however, the data set A might not be always like this. So this is how it acts on the entire plane if A is is R2. So if A, if otherwise, uh, the same that my space looks like this, uh, then ReLU is not a quotient function. Um, or it does not strictly uh, like glue parts of the of the space on itself. Then in this case, it really will be will act as a homeomorphism actually. So here you have this space, the input. This is my A, and the image of this will be just uh, the the same space topologically, just bent at two locations. Um, so Relu here um, bends actually the space. So um, so the first case. We are quotienting some parts, so the, the quotient is determined by by the, um, the so they are two points have uh, are quotient if and only if they have the same ReLU. Um, so this is the first part. The second part is actually the two spaces are homeomorphic. Um, um, just the ReLU function here just bends part part of the space, and um, um, it can actually. If, the, if if this the, the third case is actually not mentioned here, if the if the space is entirely in the um, uh, in the positive quadrant, then the ReLU activation function is just the identity. So this is a, this case here is actually a, an interesting case, which is a combination. It seems that this case here is this case, but it's not. 
So in this case, all the points in the third quadrant get mapped to the zero, and all this part here is projected on the x-axis, and all this part is projected on the y-axis. So this is a combination of the first two cases, the quotient, the quotient and the bending. So we saw the role of the ReLU activation function on the input space. Uh, the other role, which is the, the role of the matrix, this is well known and well understood. Um, so matrix W acts on the space by rotation, scaling, translation, and sometimes it, it, it quotient also some part of the space. So these are the possible action for the matrix W on the input space. So if you put all of these together, um, then you can think about the, what the neural network as a, is doing as a, a, as a continuous function. So the neural network, uh, what the neural network is doing, it's acting on the space by a finite sequence of topological operations. Um, so these are uh, translating, rotation, quotienting, and scaling, and bending. And, and so in order to achieve, uh, and the final goal for it is to achieve the classification task. So for the classification neural networks, uh, the final uh, m desired map is to map all the labels into the corresponding uh, uh, vertices of the simplex. Uh, then the, uh, what the neural network is trying to do uh, via those topological moves is to find the appropriate sequence of bending, scaling, translating, rotating, and quotienting uh, to map the space uh, with those uh, 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 allowed moves to the final space here. So let's state this precisely. A classification, a softman classification neural network is trying to deform the input topological space uh, to the simplex uh, on n vertices, such that each subset uh, with label uh, i plus one is mapped entirely to the Voronoi cell or the interior of the Voronoi, Voronoi cell associated with the vertex i, okay? And the neural network is trying to do that via a finite sequence of continuous topological operations, bending, quotienting, rotation, translation, and scaling. So um, this is done by understanding um, what each layer function is doing and by using this, uh, this topological terminology as well. So given the above setting, we like to think of a neural network as a topologist that is trying to deform a space A to another space B by a finite sequence of topological operations. We saw that in the case of a new radio neural network, those operations are bending, scaling, translating, rotating, and quotienting. And actually, um, it's not very hard to convince you yourself that for any nonlinear function other than ReLU, this is also the case. And uh, this analogy here uh, is very closely related to the fact that the parameter landscape of a deep neural network has a very large local number of minima. So let me explain what I mean by this. If, a two to, if two topologists are given the task of deforming the input space here to the final output space, then um, very highly unlikely that these two topologists would agree on uh, the sequence uh, that they will use in order to achieve this, this classification task. So if I constrain those topologists by the spaces, just like I do for the neural network, then these two topologists would probably make different choices, say, for the first projection. And uh, similarly for a neural network, if I train this neural network uh, one more time, uh, I will probably not going to obtain the same sequence, uh, but I will probably achieve achieve very good task at the end as far as classification is concerned. So this is consistent with, uh, with, with this observation that has been proven over and over in practice um, that uh, um, a local minima uh, consistently provide similar level of performance on multiple experiments. Um, and that are very close to the, to the global minimum. So from this perspective, there is some sort of correspondence between local minimum uh, for the landscape uh, of, a new, of a deep net and distinct sequences of continuous operations that yield topologically equivalent sequence of spaces. So earlier in our experimentation, we made a choice to map um, uh, topologically labeled data from its space to uh, a larger space. And uh, the reason for this um, is actually heuristic. We we did not prove any result about this yet. Um, so this is just a uh, an observation that we noticed uh, why we train those neural networks on on um, on manifold of dimension m. So we observed that if we put the manifold in its general position, then the training becomes much easier. 
so uh, the, the general position theorem asserts that any M manifold unknots and N links uh, if you uh, uh, put it in high enough uh, uh, Euclidean space. So strictly speaking, a neural network really does not need this much space in order to, to separate the data. Uh, uh, one one form of the universality actually uh, tells you that you only need to go one one dimension higher than the ambient space. Uh, so uh, uh, that's usually enough to approximate uh, um, any function. However, in our experimentation, we noticed that we don't need to make the neural network as deep if we put the uh, data set inside its uh, general position dimension. So larger than uh, 2m plus 2. So let's see and study an example that illustrates the relationship between knotting linking and neural networks. So here in this example, I'm considering a data set uh, of two toruses that are linked together. And I'm acting on it by a neural network that consists of six layers. So I'm going to show you uh, the action of this neural network after training on this data set. So the first function that I chose um, for this neural network, um, it actually maps uh, the data from R3 to R7. And the reason for mapping things to R7 is again related to the general position theorem. Um, so here I'm, I'm given the neural network a little bit extra room uh, to manipulate the space to mapping things to R, not to R6, to R7. And you see here the data has been separated. Earlier, uh, recall earlier that uh, actually, if you map things here from R3 to R3, the neural network would never be able to separate um, uh, this, this data set because at best, we saw that the ReLU uh, layer function acts on this data set by a homeomorphism. And we know that you cannot separate uh, a linked data by, by homeomorphism from R3 to R3. So you, you have at least to go to R4. Um, so, um, and uh, if you... Uh, if we observe the other, the second activation function, so here data is almost separated. Here it's very separated, like a, it's um, like uh, uh, the even the activation got farther away from each other. Um, and uh, the same thing if I consider the, the next map, um, the neural network is cautioning uh, parts of the manifold. So here, uh, the the yellow part is has been cautioned to almost a point. And the other part is, uh, is is still a torus, but this is not going to be the case. Uh, everything is going to is going to be quotient out to uh, as small as possible space, uh, uh, because it's not needed as far as classification is concerned. Again, this is a repetitive pattern in all this uh, those ob our observation and all this this uh, uh, the entire talk here. Uh, the the, the uh, it, every time a neural network does not need certain information, it tries to get rid of that. Uh, so the dimensionality is not needed as far as the classification is, is concerned. So it gets rid of it every time it it can it can do that. Um, so here from R uh, seven to R three, uh, you see here these uh, the, clearly you started to see the one D uh, thing happening, and uh, uh, the one D for this one is going to occur in the next layer. So you see here maps all this part actually to uh, almost a point and max, maps the other part to, to, to this line. So the, I'm not showing the last two functions here because they, they basically just modify this, this part uh, uh, just very slightly. Thank you for listening.